so this is part two for those of you that weren't around uh, last week. Um, there's the quick summary. I'm sure the majority of you have uh, seen this before, but basically um, I'm a freelance naturalist and photographer, occasional tutor with various people, including the Field Studies Council. But in this context today, the author of Centipedes, Millipedes and Woodlice for the British Myriapod and Isopod group. Um, and that's largely the material that we'll be looking at today. Um, last week, as I say, in case anyone uh, missed it, uh, the introduction uh, was last week. It's now up on um, YouTube on the Teniptra project page at that link. So uh, do catch up there. I will briefly summarise um, some of the information that we talked about last week, but uh, obviously, as most of you, I suspect, uh, were with me then, I, you don't want to be bored through that again. So we'll move quickly on to actually identification of British species uh, this week. Um, really just the identification characters that we'll be focusing on and how they combine to help us identify certain British species. Then there'll be a little bit of time for questions at the end. So that is the CD-ROM, which we've mentioned before, um, and it's kind of draws to a conclusion the uh, three or four talks that we've done based on that CD. So you can find the millipedes, centipedes, um, and now part one of the woodlice on YouTube, uh, if you want to catch up on that. If you want to buy a copy of the CD, which uh, is here, um, it's no longer available from Nature Bureau, but you can obtain it for seven pounds directly from BMIG and uh, 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 Paul Harding will send you one of those directly. Um, some parts of this evening, um, it's quite useful to have the CD after this event because there's a key on there if you want to use that, which prints off quite nicely, which I'll show you when we get to that point. So again, very quickly, um, all that you might want to know about British myriapods and isopods, the woodlice, the isopods, um, is on the bmig.org.uk uh, site. Checklists, photographs, images of various things and brief in, uh, descriptions and maps. So do go to BMIG website. The Facebook group, um, excellent place to uh, share your images, share um, discoveries, ask questions. So do look on the Facebook group too. And a final plug for the British Myriad Pod and Ice Pod Group's virtual AGM and annual meeting this year, which is on the 10th of April. So just in um, a few days time, a uh, week after Easter. And if you wish to get onto that, the it's free to join in. And um, the, after the AGM around 2.50, there'll be four talks of general interest, including uh, something about new British isopods and uh, so you might find that interesting in the context of um, of woodlice uh, if you're interested in the intertidal species um, Warren will be discussing that as well so sign up for that um, and that will be it that'll be fun too and quick plug there we go harvestman's next three parts so get your get your bookings in okay on here we go. So a quick recap. That's a woodlouse. And <clears throat> as you will recall, I should be asking you all these questions. Say, so come on then, what are they? They're crustaceans, aren't they? Uh, seven pairs of legs, jointed antennae. Isopoda means they have equal feet. So very little differentiation between the feet, just a little bit of genitalia uh, or, or um, sexual dimorphism occasionally. Uh, in some of the structures of the legs, but otherwise they are very different to most other crustacea, but they are little land shrimps. So that's the full uh, classification. And we are just focusing on the terrestrial woodlice, which belong to the suborder Onyscidia. Um, so that's all we'll be dealing with for this evening. Again, a recap for you uh, as a reminder, I'm sure you will need a recap of this. I can never remember the difference between which is the perion, which is the pleon. Perion 
is the first seven segments here. So you've got the head with the antennae and the mouth parts and uh, eyes if they have them. Seven body parts called the perion. The structures over the top is that the shield, um, the tergites, if you like, uh, are called perionites. And beneath that uh, arise the legs. So seven perion, uh, perionites, therefore 14 legs on a woodlouse. The next five uh, segments are the pleon, and at the end there's a telson, which is basically a little tail at the end, uh, either side of which are these uropod structures. The pleons, the structure over the top, the tergites over the top of that are pleonites, and beneath that are a variety of um, structures which are for reproduction or uh, osmoregulation and, and various other things. So that was your basic woodlouse. So there's the head, antennae, mouth parts. There are the legs, seven pairs of legs, uh, each coming from uh, those perion segments and the pleopods at the rear end rather than legs. They have what are called pleopods, which are modified limbs, if you like, um, for breathing and as I say, also my regulation and, and reproduction, which there are the gills underneath. Whoa, hang on, why on earth it's decided to do that? Right, <clears throat> so we, there may be structures which will be helpful for identification, which we'll look at shortly, but we've got uh, these long structures, which might be, might be two pairs of those, might be five pairs of those. So pleopodal lungs on the pleopods. I'm sure you can remember all this. For those of you who that was far too swift for, go back and look at the other YouTube video for more details. There is the uropods, either side of the telson at the, at the rear end. And <clears throat> this is a little bit different to, I didn't go into quite so much detail last week about the, uh, the genitalia structures. Um, females are um, not so easy to identify in some of the more tricky species, but males have nice distinctive um, genitalia structures, intermittent organs of one sort or another for, um, for the, within the process of copulation for transferring sperm. Um, they also have um, a variety of secondary sexual characteristics that might be different spines on the legs uh, of one sort or another again sometimes also on, on, on the first pair of legs but various uh, modifications which can help to identify the species which are um, let's say particularly helpful if you've got male specimens so the sperm is actually transferred um, by inserting this this longer of the two modified sort of genitalia structures. There's an endopod and an exopod. The endo means sort of inner, the inner um, structure, and the exopod is the outer structure. There are two pairs of those, so you tend to have two of these endopods and two of these exopods in one combination or another. So you have these long structures and then these other flatter, wider, <clears throat> paddle-shaped, whatever you, whatever they have to be which are very diagnostic. I mean, this one, I, how clear it is on your screen, but there are a couple of little uh, things sticking off at the edge there, which are very helpful diagnostic features. So uh, these modifications, very helpful if you can't identify your woodlouse on gross morphology. More in a moment. So that's really a recap of the majority of, the, 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 a summary of, of the, um, morphological stuff that we talked about last week. So from here on in, it's, it's pretty much new stuff. Um, I'm going to show you the characteristics that we're looking at. Um, it's just really similar things that we've just seen. And the, there's, a, there's a key which I mentioned earlier. If you, if you obtain the CD, um, the CDs actually print off really well. Um, because basically they're PDFs. And within the CD are these chart-like keys, 
a little bit if you were on the centipede um, course, it's, it's a matter of matching up what kind of variety of, of characteristics you've got to narrow down your species. But they do print out quite well. So if you've actually got the CD, you can just print these off and put these by your microscope. Um, just for the sake, as I've got it in my hand, this is how it looks as a book if you wish to print off the CD. So if you prefer hard copies of your publications, it does work quite well. Um, so pretty much the same sort of stuff. Um, it just prints out quite nicely. So enough of a plug for that, but uh, we'll look at the key in a bit, but I can't just normally in a face-to-face um, -face situation, I would hand out a copy of that to everyone and we could work through it together. Um, I'll just show it to you briefly and then we'll move on and summarize the characters uh, uh, in the scenario that we've got online. Um, it's a very basic key to just a, a selection of British species and at the end I'll show you um, some key further reading but really that's the that's the detailed Linnaean society style key that you'll be needing if you're looking at detail. This is the one with all the genitalia uh, imagery in and um, alternatively there's Steve Hopkins paid gap key. Um, it's now got a different cover to this but again lots of information, slightly more simple uh, simplified images and, and drawings but fantastic excellent books for identification. So uh, we'll re recap on those at the end um, if you wish to obtain any other. Those are actually books that are available. So we'll start with the famous five. Um, when, when looking at woodlice, certainly when I started looking at woodlice, there was always this reference to the famous five, the most easily recognised, the most common species, which you know, everyone should start with learning the famous five. So Porcellia scabra, Aniscus ocellus, Armadillidium vulgari, uh, Philoscium muscorum, and Trichoniscus pusillus. Well, the famous five are now a frustrating eight, at least. Um, there are two possible species that you might find, certainly if you live in the southwest, that, so Aniscus ocellus isn't that straightforward. Um, if you live in the north, inland, Armadillidium vulgari, isn't very straightforward. It's not really there. It's not common at all. Um, if you look, if you think Philoscia muscorum, nice straightforward. Well, that's been split into two species, and uh, Trichoniscus pusillus is now very often recorded as Trichoniscus pusillus ag, an aggregate, an aggregated species, because there are two very very similar. So we're going to throw out any ideas of having the famous five because. Um, they're not, they're not as simple as they used to be. So uh, we'll look at them more in, in detail shortly. <clears throat> but identification of woodlice, it's, it's not that tricky. Um, as we mentioned last week, uh, a lot of the characters that we're looking for may well be there from birth, effectively. So those little mankers that we refer to as those little baby hatchling um, woodlice, some of the characteristics, not the colour, and obviously some of the um, uh, structure of the, of the creatures are not there at that size, but there are other characteristics which are going to help you to narrow down which woodlouse you're dealing with. So the first thing um, we need to say is they are characters which, while available um, in juveniles, I'm referring to adults effectively, so a, a full grown adult will um, present these characters most clearly, as with most keys and, and things that you've worked on in the past. So, conveniently, as with many creatures, where people just think, oh, one well, would last is the same as the next, they do vary very wildly. That's a very, very tiny uh, little Reductoniscus from Kew Gardens. Um, there are lovely multicolored ones, and then there are the perhaps traditional, more expected slate grey, um, dull looking, uh, woodlouse like things. So quite a variety and different sculpturing, different patterns on them. Um, so colour and sculpturing, 
it may be that they have longitudinal ridges, which are quite distinctive in, in the Haplothalmus genus. Um, lots and lots of little tubercles and spines in, in a variety of some of the small um, Androniscus, Trichoniscus types of um, groups, Trichoniscoides, sorry, um, or, or quite a smooth body. So the sculpture on the, on the body surface is quite helpful. So that's longitudinal ridges. Those are rows of tubercles across the body, and that's a smooth surface. So quite varied, just looking at those three things, there's quite a lot of variation um, within you know, just, just a few wood lice. So colour, I we mentioned, is useful, but not necessarily always diagnostic. So that's Armadillidium vulgari, so perhaps Traditionally, we might think of it as a dark slate grey looking creature like the top left there, possibly this sort of more mottled browny grey, but they are very variable. Um, this beautiful orange one or this one with the sort of pale edges and the, and the patterning, this one with the yellow flecks, quite a variable species. So you may be looking, you may get a, a little confused and you might be looking at different characters than just colour, but certainly for some wood lice, colour will do the job for you um, quite helpfully. So there's a lovely array of, you know, they're just to dispel any myths that wood lice are boring and gray. I mean, this, this beautiful Trachoniscoide sarsi here is almost fluorescent orange, a beautiful thing. Um, but yeah, bright pink, multicolored, yeah, just fantastic beasts. Um, so Never let it be said that they're dull and grey and boring. The most straightforward character that is really helpful and readily seen in wood lice is just what it, the outline looks like. So is it a continuous, smooth outer edge like this, or does it have a step and a discontinuity? So it's the where the, the perion and the pleon have a discontinuity, there's a step. Um, it's narrower at the back than it is at the front. Very easy and very helpful in a whole range of wood lice. So just as soon as you see one, just look at the outline. That's really helpful. Is there a junction? Isn't there a junction? Um, very simple. The next thing is it's slightly more detailed in that you'll need a hand lens to see this. Um, but the Antennae, we mentioned there's like a, an elbow in the antennae and at the, at the tip, um, and you, it, if you've never looked at the tip of a woodlouse antennae, you think, well, how do I know where, where the flagellum starts? But the flagellum is fairly straightforward to realize that it's the last bit. And uh, as you'll see in a lot of the other images, it's quite clear which the flagellum is. So it's really just those last few segments. And there may be two, there may be three, there may be several which just taper down into a sort of tuft of hairs, or there might be 10 or more uh, quite similar bead-like uh, and very regular segments. And we'll look at these on some wood lice in a second. Um, so this one's got three segments to um, the flagellum. So if it's got three segments at the end of the antennae, it's going to be um, within the uh, the, these families at Philosky muscular, whoop, go back one, excuse me, um, Philosky muscorum or Philosky affinis, meniscus ocellus, clearly one, two, three segments. One, two, three, one, two, three, there we go. So antennal flagellum, this is where if you've got a, perhaps a sample from pitfall, uh, lots, of, lots of specimens from uh, pitfalls, and there are a lot of juveniles are very small, you could probably pick out the aniscus from the porcellios because the aniscus will have three segments at the end of the um, antenna. So very simple thing to look for, and you can see it with a hand lens very easily. If there are just two uh, segments at the end, then could be, it's likely to be uh, porcellio, porcellionides, uh, Silisticus has just two segments and all of the armadillidium uh, species which curl into a ball 
um, they also have just two distinct segments on the antennal flagellum. That was me knocking my mouse. Let's go back again. Okay. <clears throat> 10 plus bead like segments. Um, more often than not, you're going to be encountering these at the coast or in some very damp uh, habitats. I mean, occasionally you find them in other situations, but um, Lygia and Lygidium have uh, like these 10 very regular um, antennal segments, or they, they may be 10, 12, or thereabouts, but very regular, more like an insect antenna. A uh, very similar length of segment throughout. Um, the other thing is with with Lygia and Lygidium, they've also got very distinctively forked uropods at the rear end. Um, one's a bit longer than in one species, uh, in one genus than the other, all their equal lengths. But um, we'll look at that again, as I say, at the end when, when we go through a gallery of these species. But antennal um, flagellum, very useful character to narrow down what you're looking at. Now there are a lot which just have three, four, five, many, it's hard to tell. They're, so, they're very small species usually that have this tapering uh, flagellum and usually there's a little bristle or something at the end, but they are, they are very small species. You know, we're talking two, three, four millimeter species. So it isn't the easiest thing in the world. But when, when, you, when you look at them, you'll see that it's, it's, there's nothing that distinct. You can't really count the number of antennal segments as easily as you might in some of the larger ones. But just the size of the thing is also giving you a lot more clues as to what it is anyway. Um, but nonetheless, it's different to the two and three of the previous types that we're looking at. So Aritoniscus is probably the largest one that you're going to see with, with, with this kind of tapering antenna, Hapophthalmus androniscus, trichoniscoides. Metatrichoniscoides is very tiny, very, um, very small thing indeed, um, but very fine tapering antennal um, flagellum. So <clears throat> a key character, um, all of those things are great. The eyes, um, very useful. So if the thing has eyes, um, because not all species have a celly at all. So often when we, we talk about eyes, we, we, we say how many eyes has it got? And we say it's got, you know, oh, it's got three eyes. What we mean is three a celly on each side. We, we had this issue with um, centipedes. So occasionally, forgive me if I say, oh yes, it's, it's, it's got, this one's got three eyes and that's one, that's got one. It doesn't mean it's got three eyes, one in the middle and one either side. Um, three ocelli in a group, one ocellus, several ocelli, maybe even um, the, the coastal Lygia, they're almost like a compound eye like a, and an insect. So um, you know, perhaps a hundred fragmented uh, faceted uh, uh, elements to the eye. So yeah, many, many there in this aniscus, many ocelli in the eye one single eye there, three little uh, acelli there, one single eye there, and three there. So again, needs a hand lens in many cases to have a look at. Um, the other key thing is note the color of any of your woodlice that you collect. If, if it's some of these smaller ones, they lose the color when preserved. So if you're popping them into alcohol for long-term preservation, or to examine them under the, uh, your microscope. The lovely red pigment in perhaps this trichoniscoides here, and this pigment across uh, its sort of forehead, um, a lot of that's lost. You may end up with just a, a dark colored eye and you're not quite sure between species because some of the coloration of the eye is quite a helpful character. So make a note of the color um, if, if, it's, if it's a red eye. Um, then record that. It's really only in some of these tiny things that that's an issue. So you may have a group of three ocelli like that. It might be one single large ocellus, or it might be blind and these little bumps um, can be mistaken for eyes. And sometimes I've found that these little bumps on, on, on the eye of something, uh, on the head of, uh, of something like a metatrichoniscoides, 
attract dirt as well. So you might mistake a little piece of dirt for an eye, which may completely throw you off track as to which species you're dealing with. So um, be careful as to just check which eyes, you uh, how many eyes it's got. We mentioned before the number of uh, pleopodal lungs um, at the back. Really, the, the, all you're looking for is that there might be two in certain uh, couple of uh, main groups, um, which we'll summarize later, might just have two of these white patches on each side, or there might be five. If it's five, that's quite helpfully, helpfully diagnostic of, of the species. So if you flip these things over and note that there are um, white pleopodal lungs, um, that's, that's a useful characteristic. And it's something which can disappear in alcohol. Um, so if you if you preserve these things, these five um, paired lungs may not be as obvious as they were in life. So a helpful thing to see while it's still alive. The shape of the uropods and the telson. So just simple things like what shape are these is very helpful, very diagnostic. Uh, something like this is quite parallel sided with a nice rounded tip um, on Procellia dilatatus there, you can see, not entirely parallel, but it's, it's virtually parallel sided, um, as opposed to something like this, um, which is Procellia scaba, which is, is quite triangular and quite converging. And this is somewhat something in between. And a lot of the armadillidiums and things which roll into a ball, uh, the telson is quite uh, blunt and short because if you're rolling into a ball um, you don't want that getting in the way so as to give a smooth outline it's uh, cut off quite dramatically there. Likewise the shape of the uropods we'll look at some different uh, shaped ones but these are mostly spear shaped so they're slightly expand and then narrow slightly expand and narrow so the, the widest point is sort of not quite at the, the base on, on these, certainly. Um, whereas, again, those that curl into a ball and the omdilidiums, it's a very short, stumpy uh, little uropod um, because when it rolls into a ball. So you can see the, the uropods there are this stumpy shape so that they roll nicely and conveniently. Uh, into a perfect sphere, unless your Silisticus convexus, uh, in which case they're quite long and they stick out. So, you know, it may be a, you've got a, a, a woodlouse which is curled into a ball and you might not be quite sure whether it's Armadillidium vulgari, but actually if they're sticking out like that, these long uropods, it's Silisticus convexus. Nice character to, to see nice, uh, very distinctive. And it also leaves its antennae sticking out, uh, which we'll look at in a moment, several do. Um, not going to go, the, the nature of this talk, we haven't got time for the detail of looking at genitalia, just reiterating what I said earlier. They, they are very diagnostic of species. You're looking at these structures and with a hand lens and, and even occasionally with the naked eye, you can see whether you've got a male um, these may just be hanging down very slightly from the back of the body. And I just have a couple of structures that are sticking out a little bit, which will help you to recognise that it's a male. And those would be the specimens to take. They might be slightly smaller than the females as well. Um, but given the vari uh, variation in size and growth in a population, that's not necessarily a diagnostic thing. They're not all going to be adult at the same time. Um, but if you can see those uh, endopods, uh, hexapods sticking out, uh, certainly the endopods uh, you might spot. Um, and I mentioned the first and seventh legs may be uniquely modified one way or the other with these various spines of one sort or another. Um, something like haplothalmus is really quite key, quite critical to tell the difference between Mengii and Montevagus. So, and again, with a hand lens, you can often see that they're, you know, you've got a male because it's got this more robust hind leg. But that's pretty much, I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll point out one or two key characters, but we're not, not going to major on genitalia tonight. Um, 
this is useful, it's quite useful. I mentioned the um, <clears throat> how they curl into a ball is very useful to identify um, at least between one or two species. I mentioned that Silesticus has got these long sticking out um, uropods and will leave its antennae sticking out. Um, Armadillidium nasatum also leaves its antennae sticking out, but doesn't have the long um, pointed uh, uropods. I will be recovering this later if you're desperately trying to make notes on this or anything. Um, is this will be recapped um, per species. Um, some of them make a beautiful closed, lovely closed sphere and, and really make a nice tight ball. Armadillidium pictum, Armadillidium vulgari do that very well. The one that I'm showing here, the red asterisk over here, refers to the fact that this is Armadillidium vulgari and it's left its antennae sticking out. So it's not absolutely foolproof. Um, some might inadvertently have left their antennae sticking out and I guess occasionally maybe others inadvertently leave them inside when we're not expecting them to. But generally speaking, it's a helpful thing. Um, Armadillidium pulchellum, Armadillidium album and Armadillidium depressum leave a bit of a gap. So depressum perhaps looks almost perfect, but leaves a slight gap. Um, album, Again, a slight gap and porcellum tends to be not like it can't quite, can't quite manage that full closed sphere. So nice, straightforward with, with just, just looking at armadillidium species there. That's just seeing how they roll up. You know, if you're not sure about something, just give it a chance to roll and it might give you a few more tips for identification. Another thing is just um, while they're still alive, um, how do they run? How do they behave? Uh, some people refer to um, runners and clampers and, and creepers, depending on their mode of escape. The runners are very quick. They have noticeably longer legs. Um, and this is the one that's commonly found in, in stables and dung heaps, the um, Porcellionides pruinosus. And you can see it's got big back legs um, that, that do stick out and they they do shift as soon as you move a piece of dung heap or whatever, these things disperse very rapidly. A definite runner. The clampers are these ones which, you know, you can see they're designed really to, to not let you in the, the, the sort of flanges around the edges so they can clamp themselves down to a surface and it's quite difficult if you try to pick them up, get your nails underneath to, to, to pick them up from a, a smooth substrate. Um, but certainly the porcellios in the niscus um, are a clamper, um, like a limpet, really. And then the creepers, it's not necessarily a very helpful diagnostic characteristic. Some, it's, some are behaving um, in response to other things, really. Um, temperature and light levels are, are the reason for their actual movement and behavior. But a lot of the little things tend to wander off relatively slowly, but there are one or two that are a little bit quicker. And with, with experience, you'll, you'll, you can recognize that perhaps Trichoniscoides albidus is a much more sluggish thing than Trichoniscus pusillus, which looks kind of similar. So, so it can be helpful to an extent. <clears throat> And I guess the final and obvious thing for a couple of species at least is what habitat are they in? And if, if, these, if you're finding a little wild, a white woodlouse in an ant's nest, um, then Platyarthrus hoffmanseggi is um, always associated with ants. So um, finding, finding that in an ant's nest is a real big giveaway. And likewise, um, Halophiloscia and Lygia are very much restricted to tidal zones, splash zone, um, can quite happily be submerged by seawater. So again, if it's, if it's right on the coast, it's on a groin going out to sea, um, then that in itself is narrowing down the species you're looking at. Well, more on them later. So the chart I, I mentioned, uh, I'll show you them briefly now just to show you how the chart works. 
it doesn't cover all British species, as we mentioned last week. There's there's at least sort of sixty that you might encounter in indoors and out. Um, but there are twenty seven of the more distinctive or more common species in these charts, which we'll have a quick look at now. So this is the way the charts work, and so you can print these off from the CD reasonably easily. So along the top, first of all, what what are the antennal flagella doing? How many are there? Um, are they are they uh, just a, a, a single conical tapering tiny little thing, or are there ten or more sections, three sections, two sections? And just going back, <coughs> um, how many pairs of clear podal lungs? Those little white patches at the rear end, none at all. Two, five. Um, what's the body outline like? Are they continuous, smooth, nice outline to the body? Or is there a step, that discontinuous outline? Um, body sculpture, any kind of spines, bumps, is it smooth? Um, that, that's very characteristic of many species. So what's the body sculpture like? I mentioned uh, we're calling it defensive behaviour for want of a better description. So that's where the creeper runner um, uh, clamper comes into it. How many eyes does it have and what colour are they? So, yeah, a celly per side. One black eye or three tightly grouped black eyes, perhaps. So that's summarised in that column. What do the Europods look like? And then any further additional comments, perhaps distinctive coloration, something like that, uh, or any other features. Um, or it may simply say mm, there are two species here. You're not going to be able to recognise them unless you identify, unless you examine a male. So then, finally, how long are they? What sort of size? What kind of is this a big creature or a small creature? And then its name. So that's that's the format. The shading kind of works in that these were all the The top two are continuously uh, continuous outline and this bottom section are um, stepped. Uh, again, the, the coloration kind of groups together things which are similar. So the, the thing with 10 distinct uh, sections, some of them might just be on a rocky shore. Um, you, get the, you get the picture. So we're looking at, uh, Yes, 27 species are summarised there, and I'm going to show you um, those all in uh, a gallery of images now. So while I've shown you those, I know you can't possibly take that in. When it's on YouTube, you can have a closer look at that. And <clears throat> um, yeah, if you, if you need to get a copy of the uh, CD, there are still some available, uh, plenty available from BMIG. But there are other books available which uh, cover more species. But this is quite a, a nice intermediate. I would say this, if anyone has used this, perhaps with uh, kids or beginners, this is a great way of introducing people to some of these basic things that I'm talking about, the body outlines, the antennal flagellum. That's all summarised um, beautifully in here. The next step up from that, is probably this chart in front of you on screen. Um, next would be the aid gap, and then probably finally the uh, Oliver and Meachin. If uh, you want a little more of a dichotomous key, my original key to Sheffield species, um, this is now available on the Sorby Natural History um, Society's website uh, as a PDF. So this has a little uh, key in here to woodlice, um, not dissimilar to the, the species that are covered on the chart on your screen. Um, if you want to find this, go onto the Sorby website and look under the Sorby Invertebrate Group section of the website, because it's not always easy to find. But there is a link at the end, which you can have a look at. <coughs> So, yeah, a whole host of, depending on how far you want to go in and whether you're trying to introduce people to woodlice or whether you're, um, or yourself for that matter. Right, looking at the time, we will rattle through um, all of these um, species for you and we, we should have um, a reasonable amount of time in which to do that. 
Um, so the most obvious, um, probably Woodlouse we start with, which is the ant Woodlouse platyarthrus Hoffman Seggi. If you ever try and remember where the double letters are and the double Fs and the double N and the double G, I, I used to have double I's at the end as well. It used to be very complicated to remember how to spell that one. But uh, Hoffman Seggi, this is a blind species. It's usually, it's very subterranean. It's living in ants' nests. Um, they, they live side by side, um, not all species, but, but quite a variety of, of British ant species. Um, I'm not quite sure which one it doesn't live with, but it's certainly in, in quite a number of different species uh, of ant. And the antennal flagellum is actually too segmented, but you can't really see one segment. So it looks like you might mistake that for a long tapering um, uh, segment, but it's really just got one. The, the key thing with um, uh, the key thing with platyarthrus is they're always twitching. Presumably, it's because it's blind, it, it relies very heavily on its antennae to find its way around. And they're a very twitchy little uh, beast, but absolutely gorgeous, um, like ivory. So it's this sort of transparent white that shows the, 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 the sort of amber coloured, cream coloured body um, beneath, and a very attractive, but, but quite small um, woodlouse. But, virtually unmistakable really um, you could possibly think it's got eyes and start identifying it as a young uh oniscus ocellus or something like that if there's a bit of fluff a bit of dirt that leads you to believe it may have an eye but generally speaking um the antennae are quite a distinctive shape so i think platyarthrus is probably one that you will always um, remember the other one, which is probably very well known to a lot of people, if you've been to coasts and messed about in rock pools or, or um, cliff sides near uh, where the, the get uh, inundated by the sea, um, Ligia oceanica, so well known, it has a common name. Um, so the common sea slater, very distinctive. It's got these compound insect-like eyes. It's got the uh, antennal segments which are 10 plus, uh, very e evenly sort of spaced, very similar sized segments. Um, and the, these very obvious forked um, uropods at the end, and those are equal in length, um, give or take, um, at each fork of the uropod. So a very distinctive piece. Uh, beast indeed um, and they're very big for for a, a British woodlouse that is a they, they are I think they're up to about two and a half three even possibly three centimeters some of the largest ones um, if you include this certainly if you include the europods but it's 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 by far the biggest um, that you'll see and I'm sure you're all familiar with it um, don't see them much at low tide or um, in the daytime um, but Certainly, when the, at, at night and um, <clears throat> after the after the tide's just pulling away, you might you might see these things if you search between the rocks and under seaweed. It was um, <clears throat> someone asked a question last week, so here's your answer. I'm not quite sure it was asked, but because they are so different to our other species of millipede, uh, millipede woodlice. Um, because they are so uh, different, really, and because they are so capable of being inundated um, by, by salt water, um, the, the genetics has been recently looked into and the, the whole taxonomic makeup of the woodlice uh, in, the, in that paper down there looking at the, the uh, the genetic evidence against monophyly in Oniscidia implies a need to revise scenarios for the origin of terrestrial isopods. That's the paper uh, by uh, Dimitriou, and it's basically suggesting that now um, Ligia oceanica is lumped in with the marine 
um, isopods rather than the terrestrial isopods. So uh, no longer uh, within the Oniscidia, uh, but um, its own Ligiaidae. Um, the paper proposes the erection of a new family, Ligiaidae. Ligid that's it. So not to be mistaken for the Ligiaidae, the Ligiaidae, you know what I'm saying. It's there in front of you. Um, I think they could have possibly come up with a slightly different name, don't you? Um, but there we are. So it's 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 an it's a, a reasonably new, uh, relatively recent paper, and I'm not quite sure how widely it's accepted. But it makes a lot of sense that that actually now counts as more of a marine isopod than a terrestrial isopod. We will always include it, I'm sure, um, within because B uh, BMIG now actually are embracing the um, intertidal and uh, uh, the, the other isopoda on the on the coasts. Um, this is this is always going to be included really within the terrestrials as, as we see them, I think. Um, for even those of us that don't um, dip into pond into uh, pools, we'll probably still record this one. So there we are. Um, yes, it is probably effectively now a marine isopod. Um, this is um, another one that's got 10-ish um, even antennal flagellum segments, Ligidium hypnorum. It's really fast. It's another really fast one. This is, this is very much a runner. As you turn over a stone, you really have to be rapid to, to, to grab this thing. Um, it has forked um, uropods at the end again, um, but one of them's a bit shorter than the other. So then they're not as they're not as obviously um, similar as they are in Lygia, in Ligidium, one is shorter than the other. So distinctive, it's also quite attractively colored. Um, these these mottled patterns, uh, and again, it's got the sort of compound eyes that uh, Ligia has. So these these are again the sort of things that are going to run away from you quite rapidly, um, and be much more coastal or in damp environments. So, to the one of what was uh, a famous five. The common shiny woodlouse, Aniscus sicellus, they are quite shiny. They tend to be relatively smooth along the back. Um, juveniles are, are, are much bumpier um, along the back, so not quite as uh, shiny and smooth as that. If, if it's a young Aniscus, um, they still have quite a texture to, to the back. Um, but a relatively distinctive and, and very commonly encountered. Um, around Sheffield, when we mapped these and recorded them, these are the ones which are slightly more rural, slightly more woodland, rural, um, but equally you'd find them in, in towns just the same. And uh, Porcellia scaba was a little bit more common in urban areas and slightly less so in the rural areas, but that's not very helpful in terms of um, identifying which one you've got. It's just a, a trend, at least, um, at least around here. So they have three flagell uh, fl flagellum segments to the antenna, which is uh, very key and very uh, straightforward to observe. They often have this pale edge to the uh, outside of the body, um, the outside edge, almost invariably quite pale. Um, maybe this sort of second band pale uh, there, but certainly the outer edge. And often flecked with yellow, uh, these sort of fat bodies either side of the center of, of, of the body along the back there. So quite pale, a little bit yellow flecks, you know, three antennal segments. It's it's your common shiny woodlouse, Aniscus acellus, and they really are quite common and a beautifully, obviously, um, continuous outline. It's no longer as straightforward as it was if you live in the southwest, um, Brittany, northern Spain, I think, um, but certainly that sort of 
um, a, a Lusitanian, as I think is the term we're looking for. Um, I'm not sure if these, if the other, if this also occurs in Southern Ireland. Not certain, but there's this southwestern subspecies called uh, Aniscus ocellus occidentalis, which um, is slightly more domed, um, a little bit more armadillidium uh, in profile, perhaps often more brightly colored, perhaps these uh, fatty bodies are a little bit more pronounced, um, but not much else uh, that, that tells you it, it's different, a little bit smaller on average than Aniscus ocellus. ocellus. Um, they're not actually uh, a separate species, um, it's a subspecies really, because they will breed together and produce an intermediate. Um, and because of that, um, they, they quite readily um, uh, form these intermediate uh, subspecies as well. So it's actually, it's potentially quite uh, threatened in some respects because as, the, as they have started Aniscus ocellus ocellus and, and, and Aniscus ocellus occidentalis have encountered one another more and more, more of these intermediates are occurring. So Acellus occidentalis is sort of moving more towards being the intermediate form. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And Steve Gregory's uh, atlas, oh, which is, is just which is excellent for a lot of ecological information about woodlice. That's that's the sort of bible to go to, um, and that, a lot of information that which maps these these two species where they've been recorded. Um, but only, it's only really an issue if you live in those parts of the country, but, but great to record that. There are also um, other variations with uh, Aniscus ocellus and other woodlice to an extent, obviously uh, variations in, in colour that I mentioned, but um, seem to see quite a few uh, Aniscus which um, are almost um, albino, if you like. I've seen them with, with pink eyes, as well as entirely, entirely white body and, and quite pale, um, pigmentless eyes. Um, this one is more of a piebald, um, uh, mottled variation. So they might throw you in identification, but you know, it's got three antennal segments, which immediately tells you it's at least on uh, and, and the on the skidia side of um, uh, of the families. Now then, we'll take a drink. This is one of our other um, <coughs> famous five, um, which has <coughs> been discovered to be two. So, Philoscia muscorum was quite a well known uh, species, quite readily identified and recorded, and possibly not collected by lots of people. Um, but in the, the European species, Philoscia finis was uh, recognized as being very, very similar and uh, occurring together with Muscorum. And the long and short of it is that we now have both, we recognize that both species are widespread. Um, and BMIG are very keen to determine quite where a Philoscia finis actually is and where, where Muscorum is, where Affinis is. So um, a little bit of detail on the difference between these two. Um, Muscorum is it's, it's a very attractive, sh lovely, shiny, smooth species, uh, discontinuous body. So it's got the three antennal segments that Aniscus has, um, but the body is stepped on like Aniscus. So, um, you know, that, that separates those quite nicely. You can see here in particular, there's quite a step, quite that discontinuity between the perion and pleon. Um, but you can see that uh, that also works for Philoscia affinis as well. The key differences, uh, well, the key similarities, I guess, are, are that they're shiny, they've got um, three segments, and discontinuous, and they are quite varied in colour, um, which doesn't help matters. Um, but depending on where you live, you'll get populations which are all sorts of colours of yellow and red. Really, you need a male 
to identify uh, Philosophy or Finis, how or separate it from Muscorum. So um, you're looking for males, if possible. And what the character you're looking for uh, in particular, which is very helpful, is this spur on the last leg. Now, I know they look very similar in these photographs, but if you use your imagination, this spur here um, is quite erect from the, 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 the leg, so it's sticking up quite um, straight. Um, but this one is sort of folded over more like that. So, but you do have to get them at exactly the right angle if you're looking at the specimen. Uh, if you've got it under the microscope, you've got to get it right to work out whether it's doing that or whether it's doing that. So it's not that straightforward, but it, but it is a, a, a nice uh, character. And you can see that um, with a hand lens that you, you can't necessarily tell which one it is, but you can see that it's a male. And again, the, the, the um, exapods and endopods, uh, uh, there's, there are differences there as well if you can get it under a microscope. So males are uh, required. But there are some tips and pointers. If you look at this picture, um, you can clearly see that this one has got an orange outer edge there and a darker head and a little yellow spot. And these are very helpful characters. This one, it's got a very similarly colored head to the rest of the body doesn't have that yellow dot, doesn't have that orange stripe down the outside, but does have a little pale spot. So they are quite distinctive in that respect. And I think once you get familiar with them, you may start, at least it, it flags up to you that you should try and find a male. So this is Philosophy Muscorum. So this is a true Muscorum. Uh, the head is distinctly uh, consistently, uniformly dark, not necessarily black, but it is a consistent dark colour, um, uh, unlike um, a finis. Um, and where are we? Uh, that yellow spot is fairly obvious in this specimen. May not always be that obvious. This one's a little bit um, more obscure. And if you've got one of the yellow ones, then finding a yellow spot on a yellow specimen um, makes it a bit difficult. Um, but if you can identify a male, uh, that's helpful. But certainly an all yellow specimen makes life a little bit trickier. Um, but there are one or two of these characters, which with the examination you'll see. So this has got like a paired orange and pale cream band. So this two double band at the edge, it may not be, very obvious, it might just be that it looks cream and dark like here, but basically there's a band along the edge and uh, that, that's quite helpful. So, so between your yellow spot, your dark head, your orange and cream stripe, that will suggest Philoscium muscorum. So take a male and, and check the genitalia just to confirm that. If you're looking at a finis, the head is a mottled pattern very similar in coloration to the rest of the body so that's quite dark this is quite pale but the head and body aren't dissimilar and it's quite mottled uh, this one doesn't help us very much um, but trust me it proved to be <coughs> a finis but again you can see these five here there's still a variety of coloration some dark sort of almost maroony colored ones and reddish colored ones so quite varied, um, which is unhelpful, but again, the head tends to be body colored. Um, but in addition to, to that feature, there is this pale spot <coughs> um, just at the front edge here, the front edge of the uh, perionite. So pale spot, pale spot there and there, um, rather than pale bands uh, along the edge. So once you're getting these characters, find yourself a male and see if you've got philosophy and uh, a finis. So the next species, um, I won't labour the point of some of these things, that, um, some of the more common ones. The common rough woodlouse is the one that you see walking across your carpet. They're, very, they're quite tolerant of desiccation, so they, they survive 
out and about reasonably well, um, as do the, the armoured Illidium ones. Rough surface, two segments to the antennal flagellum, um, usually greyish, greyish brown, can be quite mottled. I think someone on the chat at the beginning I just glanced at described a specimen of a woodlouse it's seen possibly earlier today. It sounded like Porcellio Scaber to me. It sounded a bit like this. I think you described it as mottled sort of oranges and, and browns and greys. Um, forgive me if I'm, my description of what you wrote is, is not correct, but I think it, it's probably Porcellio Scaber, which is very common and more than likely to be one that everyone has seen. Uh, sometimes they have a pale sort of orange base to the antennae, that's, that's quite a frequently seen uh, character, but it's not consistent. Uh, these two are completely grey uh, all the way down, but, but more often than not, it, it's orange there. I know people sometimes think, oh, it's, it's a different species, but um, not so. The, the orange base is, is um, reasonably common. And the telson's quite pointed, and um, yeah, this it's it's dull, it's grey. It's got two antennal flagella on a pointed um, telson. That's sufficient in that um, it isn't one of the next ones we're going to look at, which have slightly different and more distinctive characteristics, perhaps um, more often than not, it's this. But it may be this, which looks very similar in in some respects. Um, it's a bit like a big Philoscium muscorum in that it's got a dark head um, uh, contrasting to the body. Um, it's a bit similar to Aniscus acellus in that it's got pale edging and a lot of these sort of uh, yellowy green fat bodies either side of the center. But this does tend to have um, quite a dark line, dark head, dark line, fat bodies either side, but it's got the continuous outline, uh, which says it's not Philoscia muscorum, and it's got two antennal flagellum uh, segments, not three, which tells you it's a Porcellio, not an aniscus. Um, and you see these are often on limestone walls at night, they'll come crawling out from hiding um, certainly in, in, in the Peak District, in the, on the, in the White Peak, on limestone walls there, um, these things will, will appear. Um, but in the daytime are, are much more difficult to find. You, you have to move stones and things to find them. But at night, they'll be out crawling over the, uh, over the walls. But very distinctive, Porcellio spinny cornice, dark head, light, dark line, yellow flecks. Um, probably sufficient to identify quite a big species too. Um, again, another Porcellio, this is Dilatatus. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a round, it's a very nice oval shape, um, associated with farmyards, dung heaps, compost heaps. Um, <clears throat> and so if you go looking in dung, uh, dung heaps, uh, this, is, this is one that you, you might find is very specialist in those kinds of environments. But um, you could easily mistake it for um, Porcellio scaba, a little bit more mottled, a little bit more shiny, um, smoother than Scaber. Um, but the, the Telson is, this is the one that's almost parallel sided and quite rounded. And that's, that's quite a helpful thing. So the first thing, if I'm not sure when, I'm, when I see something like this on a farmyard, um, I'll look to see if that Telson is sort of parallel sided and rounded rather than pointy. And uh, then if you put the two together, you'll see quite a distinct difference in the telson. Um, so Porcellio dilatatus. Um, Porcellio levis is quite scarce, not many records really. Um, it's, it's quite an arch and quite smooth and um, it's quite big actually, levis. And it, it's, it's a very attractive um, woodlouse. You can see side by side, this is Dilatatus that I just mentioned um, with its parallel sided uh, rounded telson. Um, in Levis, it's a much more triangular, much more pointed telson. 
Um, but also the Europods on Levis are much more tapered from the beginning. There's not that sphere shape, which I was describing earlier. So the widest point isn't here. Um, if you can see where my cursor is, hopefully, and perhaps this one's better. The widest point is actually really at the base, and then they just taper off um, into, a, into a sharp point rather than expanding and then tapering. But it, it's, um, yeah, it's a big, shiny, smooth thing, um, but not, not common. Um, tends to be found in sort of synanthropic, disturbed, human kind of environments like gardens and, and compost heaps. This is one of the ones that are often imported um, for cleaning. We mentioned last week about uh, people cleaning tanks um, with, with wood lice. And you often get orange ones of these imported. Um, there are, I, I, I used to have a, a tank with some of these in and they were, they were quite an orange, uh, entirely orange specimen. And it was Porcellia levis um, from Spain, I think. Um, this looks just like a Porcellio, um, uh, very, very similar. We've got that sort of rough surface, um, bumpy surface, dull grey and brown, a bit more mottled um, than Porcellia scaba. And, but it's, uh, and, and it's got two segments to the antennal flagellum. Uh, but uh, Trachylipus rathkii is one of these, if you turn it over, your Porcellio has got two um, lungs, uh, two pairs of, of white lungs. This one is the one with five. So um, although it's quite pale, it's clearly not got just two, it's got a whole array of these pale white lungs. That's the easiest way to recognize them. I've always found this in very damp locations. Let's just go back, damp locations. By, by the side of rivers in, in uh, marshy areas. Um, and the name escapes me, but there is a service station on the M25 that has got a pond in the center of it. And uh, I've found, I found these there as well. So um, if you're calling in the, the services on the M25 and you see that there's a, a pond, you may find Trachylipus rathkii there, um, but it's, uh, uh, it, it looks, ostensibly, it looks exactly like uh, Procellia scaba, and they may be there too. So look, flip them over and have a look for those um, lungs, those pleopodal lungs. Um, Procellia nides pruinosus is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely woodlouse. Occurs, when you find it, it's often in large numbers. It's fast. It's got these lovely pale, um, really quite white back legs, longer at the back than at the front, um, and it, it's a fast little thing. Um, maybe quite orange, this is, a, this is an immature one, and it's, it may not be quite dis, uh, distinct in these photographs, so I'll, I'll, I'll make the point that this is a discontinuous outline. Uh, this is not a smooth outline. It's more, it, it's easier to see in this large image in the top right that the uh, perion and pleon are actually not making a nice smooth outline. Um, but it, it, it does look a little bit like it is here. So that might not be the easiest character for you to see, but um, this has got a, disc, a discontinuous outline. It's just got two antennal segments and these long legs, it's fast. And it's, it's, it's almost always going to be in dung heaps or farmyards. I've occasionally found it at the edges of fields where perhaps they've been spreading manure um, or, or um, yeah, whatever from the dung heap. And perhaps a little colony is, is, has been spread into the field and you may find it under wood and rocks uh, along the um, perimeter of, of a a field that's been perhaps enriched. So, um, but generally speaking, I am one of those people in the BMIG that if I'm looking specifically for woodlouse, I will pull up at the side of the road and I will, if I see a dung heap, I get very excited and I will go and turn over the dung 
and have a look and you, you'll soon find this thing. Um, maybe also um, Procellia dilatatus, maybe even the earwig, um, the lesser earwig, which is uh, another little bonus if you're looking in dung heaps and all sorts of things. But one of the key things, it, it, it may be orange, um, as this one is, it certainly may have orange uh, uropods or even sort of tinged orange at the edge uh, of, of each of these segments. Um, but the overall appearance is this sort of purple with um, talcum powder or icing sugar, um, which is referred to as, as pruinose. Um, you'll account, encounter that in, in other species of, of animals where there's that kind of dusting that you could rub off. And you can see on this bottom one that that, that sort of white powder has, has been rubbed off. And so it's quite a shiny brown uh, woodlouse as opposed to this pruinose dusted purple looking thing. So more often than not, they like this um, and very distinctive, lovely white legs and sort of purple with a with a sort of coating. Uh, it looks like it's frosted, um, but that will that will rub off if it's handled too dramatically. Um, but one of my favourite uh, woodlice, and uh, so you find them in large quantities sometimes. Uh, if, if they like the heat, they'll be quite way down into a hot. You know, I've I've, I've almost burnt my hands while looking for these sometimes in in compost in dung heaps that are really churning out the heat. Um, this is its close cousin, um, a bit more attractive. So Porcellionidae syngendus, um, lovely yellowy mottled appearance, sometimes more brown, sometimes more red, um, but very, uh, very lovely thing. The, the distinguishing thing that separates this, you can see this stepped outline is much more obvious in these photographs um, than it was in the last. So you've got the two segmented uh, flagellum, you've got this step, um, but it's got this line across. So each of these perion segments, the perionites, there's a, there's a ridge, um, which may not be that obvious if the thing is uh, sort of hunkered down and the, the, each of the segments is slightly closed one over the other, you might not see it as clearly. But generally speaking, once it's on the move, certainly, and it's expanding its uh, body a little bit, there's, there's a ridge, which is which is quite a distinctive character. So, so there you've got um, Procellionides syngendus, attractive little thing, pretty fast, and uh, this this lovely ridge across the perionite. <clears throat> so, to the armadillidiums, I've got all of the armadillidiums that you'll encounter in uh, at least outdoors in Britain, um, and um, they're all relatively large apart from uh, a couple. So <clears throat> common pillwood louse, Armadillidium vulgari, I say this is the one that insisted on leaving its antennae sticking out, but normally the antennae would be tucked inside and it, it, it does commonly curl into quite a tight ball. Um, I know most people in south and on the coast are very familiar with this species, um, but um, it's, not, it's not everywhere inland in the north. It's got wide, you can, there are characteristics which I'm not going to go into here, but if you look in the um, guides, particularly in uh, Hopkins, got a very clear um, description of what the uropods and the, um, uh, the telson are like. And also this ridge between the eyes um, is, is different in, <clears throat> in all of the armadillidiums. It's not, it's not the easiest character to use, but in some it's really helpful. Um, so the extent of this sort of brow uh, between the eyes is quite useful, but also the shape of these and the way it rolls into a ball. If in doubt, a combination of those characters will really help you to recognize it. So that's vulgari. This is nasatum. Nasatum um, is probably one of the most uh, distinctive in that it's got a, a nose. Um, it's got a, a, this, this ridge in between the eyes sticks up, um, so you've got a nice obvious uh, feature there, um, which is 
largely unmistakable. And the antennae tend to stick out when it rolls into a ball. So just to be awkward, I've got you a picture of one here where the antennae are inside. Um, but trust me, that is Nazatum. It does have this nose. Um, the patterning tends to be a little bit more mottled than Vulgari, which tends to be slightly more even, um, but not necessarily. Uh, but this tends to have sort of two pale stripes, um, either side of a central dark band, or however you want to interpret that. But that is quite a typical looking Nazatum. There's its nose, and it's, it's sort of got a, a bit of a stripe down the back. Um, <clears throat> but that projection, that nose, is, is, is key, really. Aldenidium depressum, the key thing here is it's, it's flanged. Um, it has a splayed perion. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lovely dark, glossy, usually quite a, 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 quite a black beast, not always, uh, again, they vary. But this um, flanging splayed perion means that when it curls up into a ball, it isn't a perfect um, circle. It's got these sort of points at the edge, um, so it, it's it's expanding because of that flared edge. Um, can be can be subtle sometimes, but you can see from the front uh, this image here. You can see it, it kind of goes down and out, as opposed to just smoothly coming down, um, as with all the other species. So splayed perion segment for depressum. And this is Amdalidium album. This is, this is very small, um, very much found on salt marshes and sandy beaches, sand dunes. Um, it's coloured like sand, so it's, it's hard to find. Um, but sometimes it might be there in, in, in good numbers. If you pick falling on, on dunes, you may get loads of these things. Um, but Excuse me, it um, doesn't quite curl into a perfect ball. It has little bristles. That's one nice distinctive characteristic of this. So you've got a, a small pale armadillidium that curls into a ball. Now that could be a juvenile vulgari on the beach in, on the coast. They, they, they occur on the coast. But and uh, this thing is is not curling into a proper ball, not, not very well. Also, when they stand up, and none of my photographs show it very well, but they can be quite arched. Um, so this one here would normally, more often than not, the back might be quite arched rather than flat as it is there. I think perhaps I've been messing with this long enough and it was probably trying to run away from me and putting on as much speed as it could to get away from my flash and my camera. But um, normally they, they stand quite up, up on the legs a little bit. Um, and it, it's almost impossible to see from these photographs, but it's bristly. It's a little bit hairy. So um, right across this, it's got a fringe along there. It's definitely got a fringe all along the top of there. So it's a little hairy, small um, armadillidium on, on a beach, really. Um, but a, a lovely little thing um, and occurs on uh, quite a lot of the British coastline. Um, really good to record because it's not, it, it's not known everywhere. So uh, always helpful to know exactly where this species is. Um, now the, the two that perhaps people get mixed up with more often than not, but they're, 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 they're scarce. Um, I'll just go to the next one. I'm the lady in Paul Kellum is um, slightly more col col uh, common, uh, occurs in, um, uh, in, in a lot of limestone areas, but it's small uh, and um, perhaps not always found. If it occurs in a uh, scree, in limestone scree, it very easily, it'll curl into a ball and just falls through um, and, and gets lost. Um, but it's a lovely little thing. It's small, um, it's, it's quite shiny, dark, and has these various mottled yellow and brown edges, um, which are hard to sort of describe. Um, but um, this and the previous species, which I'll go back to, have a dark patch on this corner here. So even though they might lose their color in alcohol, this dark patch will help you to distinguish these two from other things that are in alcohol. 
Um, it leaves a little bit of a gap when it rolls into a ball. And um, although it looks a lot like the previous species, what we're looking for is in this, the corner here is cut off. Um, and it's not always obvious, but it is there. It's quite clearly cut off there. And as these lines that we've drawn on, so it, it's, it's chopped off and it isn't pointy. So it's bluntly chamfered is the way it's described in a lot of texts. Um, but if I go back to the previous one, Pictum is a red data book species. It's very uncommon. Um, if you should be fortunate enough to find it, it's bigger, it's medium sized. It's perhaps eight, maybe nine millimeters long. It's quite shiny black. Um, again, it's got these brownish edges and various mottling. I'd say this is more of a green um, and slightly less red and yellow than Porkellum. But the corner of this segment is, is much more of a point. So you can see there that doesn't, that's not cut off, that's not chamfered, that's pointy. Uh, so pointed or not pointed. It also rolls into a very nice tight ball. Um, so it's a bit bigger, it's a tighter ball, it's got a pointy corner there and Porkellum um, doesn't roll into a ball very well, it's smaller and it has a, I mean a, by smaller I mean perhaps up to five millimetres and, and this corner is cut off and chamfered. Okay, so if you're fortunate to find that, that I mean it's, it's just a, a beautiful little woodlouse that, um, both of them are. Um, fortunate around Sheffield and the Peak District, uh, anyway, um, we see this in a few locations. Um, it's, and it always seems to be mating. Uh, this one's mating. Um, I put them in captivity and they try to reproduce. Um, the final one that's curling into a ball, I mentioned before, Silisticus convexus. Um, I don't see many of these, but it's, uh, it's reasonably widespread. But the characteristic is these uropods stick out and it will leave its antennae out. Um, it's more reluctant to roll into a ball, um, hence my fingers here. Um, but uh, they do will roll into a loose ball um, with some encouragement or if they feel really threatened. May well have orange uropods at the rear end. Um, not necessarily, but but often, and it, it's quite domed, but it's not a it's it's not by any means an armadillidium. As you can see, this one's running along and quite flat. So that's Silisticus convexus. This is one of my favourites. This, uh, this is the um, this is another that rolls into a ball, <clears throat> Illuma silatum, um, and it's a very hairy little woodlouse. It's it's quite smooth. And, and very furry, it has a single black acellus. And um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a very attractive little thing when you find them not common at all. Purpley brown, um, slightly pale edges with a little bit of mottling. Um, and it, 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 it does quite a good job of, of rolling into a ball, but, but still leaves a bit of a gap um, invariably. So um, not, not a perfect sphere. But this, this big black eye is, is a very characteristic and, and the furriness. So Luma Silatum, um, an excellent woodlouse to find and record if you're fortunate to see one of those. Now, <clears throat> um, we're run, largely run out of time as ever. Um, a lot of little ones, which are quite difficult if you haven't got a decent microscope, but I will um, give you the points that I'm going to look for and then we will um, I won't go into too much detail because it's a, it's a bit specialist to an extent. But this was one of the common five, common pygmy, pygmy woodlouse, Trichoniscus pusillus, um, often recorded as pusillus ag because they all look like this. Both provisorius and pusillus just look the same. And only by ma uh, collecting a male can you really tell the difference at all. There are differences in population dynamics in that um, males are quite infrequent in pusillus, so you don't often find a male pusillus to investigate, to confirm its presence, but you may much more often find provisorius. It tends to be a 50-50 split between males and females with provisorius. So if you've got a population where there are a lot of males, a lot of females, even without going much further, it's probably provisorius. 
Um, but because you've got males there, you can have a look and you can identify it and uh, you, you'll be able to tell the difference. Um, it's got these tiny tapering antennal segments. It's got a discontinuous um, body outline and uh, three tightly fused eyes, which I will um, get back to in a moment. Um, this, I just want to point out that sometimes wood lice are purple. Um, that's usually because of an infection, an iridovirus, this viral infection, which, which makes them purple. Um, doesn't uh, indicate anything to do with the species. It's just um, unfortunately infected with a virus. Um, the eyes between um, this species, Trichoniscus pygmaeus, and the previous one, um, they look very similar when they're juvenile. So when you've got a very small Trichoniscus provisorius pusillus, whichever, um, it could be mistaken for pygmaeus. So in this image here, we've got pygmaeus, which is a tiny, it's very common and very widespread, but very under-recorded because it's so small. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good thing to record. Um, they each have three eyes, but in Provisorius and Pusillus, when they're younger, the eyes um, are not really fused together, so they're more separate. So you've got three eyes which are separate because it's young. As it grows, the eyes get bigger and become more fused together. So it almost looks like possibly one larger cellus, but it's made up of three. So if it's got three tightly fused eyes, it's an adult. Once you've got an adult, you can then look at the size of the thing and think, is it still tiny and pale with these fused eyes, in which case it's pygmaeus. If it's adult and it's got these three fused eyes, but it's quite big and it's brown, then it's pusillus provisorius. So it's, it's a problem if you've got a juvenile um, provisorius pusillus, but if you, you can, to an extent, look at the eyes to see whether they're fused or not. This, this shows you, this is, a, this is an adult pygmaeus and the eyes are tightly fused together. So there's three stuck together. The one at the bottom here is um, an immature pusillus provisorius and the eyes are slightly further apart. I know it's not that obvious, but this has also got flecks of pigment on its body, which suggests it's on its way to becoming a brown, larger species. Um, I'm hoping this is making any sense. Now you might say these are brown, but actually it's normally seen as quite a pale white, creamy color like this, with a sort of expanded um, fat body underneath like this. So you can see a sort of pale line inside underneath, which expands at the back. Um, this is really this, this sort of amber color. The actual, it's not pigmented. This is not a pigmented species, really. It's just showing the contents of the gut through. So more often than not, it looks like this whitish cream. Um, but when you close up with the camera, as I am, um, you're seeing it, the flash to an extent. I think he's highlighting the color of the body beneath. Um, so you're looking for either this transparent, pale, whitey colored, or if it's got flecks of pigment, and the eyes are not tightly together, that will be Pusillus provisorius. Tightly together, this is Pygmaeus. There are other character differences when you're under a microscope to, uh, this is not as smooth as that species particularly, but it's, it's not the easy way to identify. If you've got males, you can look at the genitalia. So that's probably about as detailed as I wish to get on that. Quickly looking at the Haplothalmus species, these are the ones with the longitudinal ridges down the back. So you can see quite clearly here in these drawings um, that they're, they're, they're long longitudinal ridges. They both look exactly the same. Um, there are subtle differences, but basically all the Haplothalmus have these longitudinal ridges. But in Danicus, there is no further ridge anywhere along the pleon, but in Mengii and Montevegas, there are these two little extra um, bumps, which you can see here 
which you can see here and you can see there. Um, from above, they're not so obvious, but they are there. So you've got these two extra bumps on the pleon in Mengii Montivagus and in Danicus. If there are none of these bumps, then you've, you've got Danicus. It's, it's, it's very easy to recognize. It's got one big black eye and longitudinal ridges, no, no additional bumps. That's Haplothalmus Danicus. Problem comes with these two in that they both have these extra bumps. So if you have these two extra um, little bumps on the pleon, on, on the, um, pleon you've, you need a male in order to recognize which species it is. Um, Montevagus is the more scarce and more southern species. Mengii is much more widespread. Um, each single black ocellus, as I mentioned, and um, continuous outline, um, but nice, straightforward, often in quite damp wood, rotting wood, um, reasonably straightforward to pick out Danicus from the others, but need a male. And, and with that, the males, um, it's, it's spines on the back legs are quite helpful for that. Uh, this one's pink. There we go. That one's easy. Rosy woodlouse, Androniscus dentiger. This also has that kind of pale um, um, line down the body, just under the surface, and this expansion of sort of yellow at the back. Uh, but more often than not, you're going to spot that it's, it's pink. Uh, a little bit of confusion with these if you've got a juvenile one of these and it's a pale one and you've got this line down the back you might think it's pygmaeus but this has got one single black ocellus not three little ones that are um, tightly together this is also um, quite a bristly thing but you know it's pink with a yellow stripe down the back and this androniscus dentiger um, lovely beautiful them um, sometimes really red and sometimes quite pale another <clears throat> um some of these really with these are now really tiny little things so we're just coming into land with the, the more difficult things but trichoniscoides are the really small uh tricky species males will really help you to identify them but albidus whoops let's go back albidus it's probably the, um, well, it's, it's, it's large-ish, it's quite large. It's usually a dull reddish colour with a pale talcin and uropods. Not always, obviously so, but this is sort of, I don't know, brick reddy, um, dull, matte, kind of not shiny, except they like wet environments. These things tend to be, you can find these in, in pebbles by streams um and therefore they can be quite wet so they can look quite shiny but they are usually quite dull you know find them under piles of bricks and things like that they'll be quite dull um and brick red and but a pale end to the uropods and telson um <clears throat> it has a single dark brown ocellus this is where you're looking what color were the eyes it's kind of dark brown rather than jet black um but but often in very damp situations and, and it's small but it's not minute unlike the trichoniscoides sarsi these are all pictures of sarsi but they could easily be to an extent sororensis so helveticus um, if you find anything with a red eye um, a tiny tiny little things um, with a red eye then they're very interesting and a little tricky to identify, but always good to know what species you need males. You can see this is a, a nice example of that the back leg will have characteristic spines and bumps which will help you identify it. But you can see there that's sort of one of the endopods and possibly or pops an endopod there, an exopod um, that you might see sticking out. So you might know if you've got a male um, it, and at, at, at times at least a times 10, perhaps times 15, times 20 um, hand lens, um, you, you could possibly see that, but you'll need a microscope to really um, identify for sure. But they are magnificent beasts. I mean, you see, I, this is like the one I showed earlier. It's like it's fluorescent. Uh, it's like glowing in the dark there. It isn't, it's just orange flecks of 
pigment. It might be pinker than that rather than orange like this. The eyes, the pink in the eye tends to suffuse into the head as well. So you've got sort of staining and that staining may be right across the sort of forehead, the fronds of, of the head. And um, yeah, they're just, just uh, fantastic. But you see this one's quite dry um, a matte uh, uh, coloured, but this glowing uh, orangey pink. So fantastic things, um, but you do need to find a male. These can, these can often be found after frosts, after if you think it's too cold for you to go out, go out and have a look and um, turn over stones, limestone areas, coasts, um, certainly Sarensis, um, um coastal but i think sarsai has been found on the coast now so i'm i'm not familiar i've never seen helvetica so i don't think i've ever collected sarensis these are tiny little things that are hard to find um so single red acellus which will lose all color um when you drop it into alcohol so really helpful to um make a note of whether it had red eye dark brown eye black eye before popping it into alcohol and you will need to pop these into alcohol really to identify them uh, to species I'm afraid but lovely creatures and if you want just that little bit smaller um, well perhaps about the same size this is Metatrichoniscoides lady guy um, there are there's also Celticus um, which is very much the same creature very small they have no eyes um, and really you're needing a male to identify. So you're looking at these endopods and these exopods, which are nicely distinctive, but require um, reasonable um, quality microscopes to be able to see uh, and recognize these. But there are subtle differences um, between these and the trichoniscoides um, antennal shape and the, and the sort of patterning of ridges on the back, but to identify whether you've got uh, or which of the trichoniscoides you have, you will need to look at the genitalia. So, and these are all of these last few species can really could be well down in soil in, in under embedded rocks. Um, so they're not they're not playing it easy, but you know, great to find, real sense of achievement with these species. Uh, I think finally, Oritoniscus flavors a little bit bigger than the last ones, but it's still got these tapering antennal segments. Uh, it's got a discontinuous uh, stepped outline to the body. Single brown acellus, quite shiny, quite a smooth, shiny body, sort of maroon brown with these flecks of pale along the side. Pretty rare in Britain, more widespread in Ireland, and I think it's been found in a number of places in, uh, I think, lowland Scotland, certainly in Scotland, someone's been following it up a river um, where it's been found. Um, but um, quite distinctive coloration, smooth, shiny little thing. So um, a nice beast. And um, finally, we'll finish with not a woodlouse. That is not a woodlouse. This is a thing that curls into a ball around where I live in Sheffield, um, rather than Arbdilidium vulgari. It's the pill millipede, Glomeris marginata. It's a much shinier, sort of blacker, shinier, but juveniles could be brown. But each segment is called marginata for good reasons. The margin of each of these tergites is pale. The key difference between woodlouse and millipede is seven segments in a woodlouse. And this has got about well, 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus a big column, plus this segment at the back. It's got um, far more than 14, legs because it's got two pairs of legs per segment and they curl into a really good tight ball and you get this first segment the column um, folding right down in that sort of characteristic manner and um, also instead of five segments at the back end uh, of that you would have in a woodlouse it's one single smooth segment at the back um, they also have clubbed antennae uh, not no flagellum uh, at the end. Um, so <clears throat> two pairs of legs per segment instead of one, lots more of them, um, quite a different thing. There's also quite a few, and um, there are a number of different types of pill millipede, um, the various <clears throat> adenomerous and geoglomerous and various glomeruses, also trachysphera, 
lovely things to find. Um, lovely and scarce. These are these are very rare. Um, that's very hard to find. Looks like a, a grain of sand. So you know, very happy for people to record pill millipedes as well as wood lice. Um, don't worry about that. So that's it. And um, that's your lot. And no, not a moment too soon. Um, these are the references which I mentioned last week as well, and I've waved around at you this evening. Kids Introduction, nice ecological book, Steve Gregory's book with the Maps and Distribution Atlas. Um, Hopkin, uh, excellent key. Basic Introductory Key, uh, Oliver and Meachin, sort of the definitive British key. Uh, the definitive Sheffield key, obviously, the, um, is, which is, this is the, um, where to find it, um, on the Sorby Natural History Society website, go to Sorby Invertebrate Group section of that website. And if you're interested in woodlouse behaviour, the one I mentioned last week was Stephen Sutton's book on woodlouse, which is um, hard to find, but you may find it secondhand, which is excellent. So there is a large woodlouse. Um, do join the British Myriapod and Isopod group um, for more information. Um, I will very quickly say this. <laughs> last week, some people asked questions. We're going to ask, I'll answer your questions now. Um, my friend and I are here. I haven't introduced my, uh, my friend, the woodlouse, this week. Um, but last week, um, someone was asking how often would I shed their skins? There is no kind of definitive answer to that. Um, more often when they're younger, less frequently with age, and also in the winter months and colder months, they tend not to shed their skin. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on the age of the thing and um, what the weather's like, really. I was asked if they were cannibals. Um, so if somebody asked uh, last week, I said, well, probably inadvertently, occasionally. Apparently in captivity, it's a much more common occurrence. Um, and particularly as they shed their skin and they are vulnerable, they eat their own shed skin. Um, so they, they reclaim some of the um, nutrients and, the, and the, the minerals by eating their own shed skin. Uh, but in a, in, a, in a captive environment or in an area where there's a dense community, they will eat each other because they'll go a bit too far. And so they'll go beyond feeding on, on a an exoskeleton that's been shed to feeding on a live cousin and and they will feed on meat and they will feed on other things if, if necessary so under stress in a in a, a captive um situation they will cannibalize one another but it's it's not a sort of common practice in the wild um, someone asked me what the smallest mesh size was on my sieve, my um, bonsai sieves. I think I said two, four and six. Well, it's three, five and seven. Um, and my 10 millimetre garden sieve. So I did go and measure those for you. And um, those were some websites for bonsais that sell garden sieves um, for, um, of that size. Um, someone also asked about climate change. And while I don't have a particularly good answer, there are two papers there which um, were quite useful um, and, and quite they're studying the effects of climate change but actually what you find is that it's fragmentation of habitat and populations which is having a much bigger impact and a lot of that and some of the fragmentation um, is happening because of associated climate change effects. Um, the second paper there is actually um, more about millipedes than it is about wood lice, um, but it's the same um, ecological uh, um, factors will be at play there. So there you go, whoever asked me that, there's a couple of papers for you. So don't say I ignored your questions, folks. I did go and have a look. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. That was that was absolutely um, fantastic. I mean, I, I, was, I was thinking this is basically uh, a field guide in digital form um, and it will be it will be extremely useful to have time stamps on those for the for the species in the in the recording so people can just go to straight to a, a particular species but there was I, I also noticed that maybe the space in that in that reference list you gave at the end for a field guide you, you know you should you should make a book out of this it's really 
uh, you know, amazing pictures. I, th I think that was that was one thing I really took away from it. Actually, it was that you know they're they're much more attractive um, invertebrates than I ever appreciated. Really, the the variety of of colours yeah. and, and forms. They yeah, really. Beautiful I was really things. taken by that. But that yeah, that was you've basically given us a, a field guide. I think. Oh, I say it's it's cool. the really more common up. and the more obvious things. But um, yeah, there's still still a good few that aren't listed so uh, plenty to keep you entertained looking through the keys folks don't worry <laughs> that, yeah that was absolutely excellent um okay we'll go to the the first one from the chat was from Anne g um which is is color common to different differing habitats as in the color of the of the wood lice for example all of one species living under a stone will be greyish, but another colony of the same species living under orange tree bark will be more russet coloured? Question mark. Um, no, it is. Well, as far as my knowledge goes, I would say it's not that reason because you will find you'll find a population which is reasonably mixed to an extent, but different habitats do produce different sort of populations in that I tend to think of the yellow ones being very coastal. I tend and and I, I see a lot more multicolored philoskia uh, on the coast than I do around here, but I will still find them. And in fairness, I, 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 it's an answer I, I don't know definitively. Someone who's perhaps a bit more experienced with woodlice um, might have observed it more but I do sometimes think well why are these ones why have we got a bunch of brown Porcellia scaba here there seems to be no obvious reason but it could be a very microscopic chemical reason that I'm unaware of um, a sort of real micro environment issue it, it, it's not that in acid environments and, and in coniferous woodland they're this color and in you know, limestone, they're this colour. It just doesn't seem to pan out like that. But I would say that coastally, it, the coastal species specimens look different to my inland ones. And I'm much more, I see many more pretty coloured woodlice near the coast. But that's just, that's just me saying that. It's, uh, I don't, it's hardly science again. But um, yeah, I don't know quite if anybody else has ever observed anything i'd be interested to know yeah very interesting and just thanks you for for answering that one couldn't be couldn't be anything to do with diet and different places i don't think so because i mean it, it that's that's the thing these these things are all they're not often certainly with Porcellia scaba i mean you'll see there's a lot of gray ones and then there's a lot of multicolored sort of brownish ones and they're all feeding on the same stuff unless at a micro level we always have to remember with these things is we look at it and think they're all living in the same place but actually that side of the rock and that side of the log are quite different in many respects as far as they they're concerned they're not they're not grazing all over the place necessarily so there may be that they've been feeding on one thing or another um which i'm unaware of um but there and i'm sure that there will be if they've got a particular plant that has decayed down which I'm unaware of again because all I'm seeing is brown sludge um, and in gardens it may be that there are there are in, impacts but I don't I don't honestly know how to produce a yellow woodlouse um, I don't know how to produce a red woodlouse by feeding them on certain things almost certainly somebody has and probably specific we mentioned last week that the multicolored ones are often the ones that are used for cleaning um, uh, tanks for reptiles and things. Um, and they may well have been bred in that direction for some reason, and they may know how to do that. But I don't. I don't. Um, it's certainly, I don't know. I don't know what the chemistry or food feeding connection is, to be honest. Interesting, though. Yeah. OK, uh, take another question from the chat. Uh, this time from Michael Tansley. Um, what magnification do you recommend for hand lenses? Is this for, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is for wood lice um, particularly, but. 
Yeah, it does. It does depend. Um, quite honest, it also depends on your eyesight. But I, I tend to now use a times eight with a times fifteen. But that's partly because I'm not always got these glasses on when I'm out in the field. For I don't often have my reading glasses necessarily, and I find that the large the sort of a times eight is just a bit like a magnifying glass, um, and I can see quite quickly what I'm looking at. The times 15 side of that, because you know, double ended thing, would then let me lets me see if it's a male or a female. If I'm um, if I'm actually seriously out recording, I always have a times 10 and times 20. Uh, again, I've got double ended and the times 20 is really useful for wood, that's small wood lice. I wouldn't have it. I would not have less than the times. I mean, you don't get much more than times 20 in a hand lens, but um, I would always have a times 20 with me if I want to look at the small ones. Times 10 would do generally everybody has, you know, times 10 is the one most people have. But um, times 20 for the little ones is really helpful. But I'd say, I mean, if, you, if someone will use reading glasses, you know, they, they interrupt everything. Take your reading glasses off before you use your hand, your hand lens. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't combine very well. Um, tell you what I do use um, if, if anybody, yeah, for a pound, from whatever what pound shop you choose, um, times 3.5 reading glasses for a quid are great for looking for these small creatures and they're a quid. So, you know, go to the reading glasses section and I've usually got several pairs of those on me at any one time. And if you get the times three and a half, you know, it's, it's only times three and a half, it's not times ten. But that can make an enormous difference when looking at millipedes and centipedes and wood lice or, or any insect. If you're someone, you know, if you've got perfectly good vision, um, you know, I need I need reading glasses. But if you've got perfectly good vision, whacking on a pair of 3.5 magnification reading glasses for a quid, why wouldn't you do it? It's really helpful. It's it's an amazing revelation for, for a quid. <laughs> Oh, well, that sounds like a really good tip. I think I'm going to give that a go myself. Okay, yeah, and, and they probably come in a plastic pot as well, you know. Uh, I've always got pockets full of them. I'm going to do that. Mm. <laughs> okay, thanks. So <laughs> that. Um, okay, uh, next <clears throat> question is from Keith Elder. Uh, what is the relationship between ant woodlice and ants? Who benefits from the relationship? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. There's, a, there's, there's quite a lot written by Donis Thorpe about it. And there is, there are benefits on both sides, but I don't know what they are. Um, they wouldn't, the woodlice wouldn't do it if it, um, for them, I think the benefit is, I think is generally they're protected because there are ants around. Um, I can't remember, I, I, I read it, I looked it up. I had the same question years ago, and I can't honestly recall what the ants are getting out of it um, at all. I think it may be just one of these associations where perhaps the ants don't get a great deal out of it. Um, but there may be people um, who've read up on it more recently than I have. Um, I think I, I think that Cloudsley Thompson, a classic, look, we're bringing out the absolute classics here. That's a, that's an absolute uh, that's the great a great book. Um, so spiders, scorpions, centipedes, and mites by J. L. Cloudsley Thompson. He probably mentions it in there, but um, it's a while since I've read that. Uh, and that's a Donis Thorpe. Um, I'm sure has there are some old papers about that, but I, I can't tell you offhand. But certainly the woodlouse is 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 gaining protection by being surrounded by these um the ants almost certainly but it is it's a very tight association ants can live without the wood lice but you don't really see those you never see those wood lice without the ants okay uh 
yeah, another sort of fascinating interactions with things that you get in ants' nests. There's quite a range, really, isn't there, mm. of yeah. insects being protected by them. I guess it's like scared seven spot ladybirds. I mean, I don't know if the ants get anything out of that, but certainly they, they like ants. So, mm. yeah, I've still not seen one of those. I've tried. <laughs> I know you have to get, you get bitten a lot by ants getting them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, this question from um, Sarah Hearn. Um, is Aniscus acellus occidentalis found in the southwest of the UK? Uh, the acellus occidentalis is, is definitely, um, yeah, Cornwall, Devon, South Wales. Um, that is, it's got that classic sort of, is that, did I say Lusitanian? Is that what they call it? That distribution that where it clips Brittany and northern Spain, so Galicia, Brittany, Cornwall, South Wales, and sometimes Ireland. There's some there are species which are very much found units sort of in that area. And yeah, Occidentalis has been found. I think actually it's also been found in the Pyrenees as well. Um, but yeah, in Britain, southwest. So if you're if you're living in the southwest, do investigate closely. It's actually if you've got a male, I say it, it's slightly smaller, occidentalis, slightly more domed, often a little prettier, a little bit more patterning. And if it's a male, the you can see the forked endopod. I guess it is or exopod. Um, it's the endopod, I think. And and there's a sort of um, symmetrically forked tip which I'm led to believe you can see with a hand lens in a male so you, you can tell you've got it um, you can confirm it back in the microscope later the intermediate form has a similar um, divergence uh, sort of uh, split at the end of the um, that part of the genitalia but it's much much smaller so I don't know if anybody can sort of so in one, the tip is like that. In one, the tip is like that, and in the other, and 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 a cellus, it doesn't it doesn't do that. So yeah, with your times ten times twenty hand lens, um, probably a times twenty, you can actually look at the genitalia of Occidentalis and recognise if you've got it, um, and then take it back to confirm. Um, so yes, if you're down there, do record them. Um, and they could be quite a way into Wales. I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, if I, I'm, while we're talking, if I could find the map, I'll get to it. But I don't know whether I'll be able to find it while we're talking. But yes, um, southwest, that's where it is. Um, yeah, and, and Lawrence Kinnersley was describing that as an Atlantic coast distribution, perhaps. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. There you go. That is Steve Gregory's map. I don't know how clear that is for anyone. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So very much southwest and, and into Wales. And there are some in Ireland there, aren't there? Yeah. There you go. So that's Occidentalis. But again, the intermediate form, it's interesting to record too, because it's, it's, it's kind of taking over. Um, so yeah, I don't quite know whether you'd call it an extinction, but it, it, it effectively these subspecies could become extinct. Mm. Um, okay, so we're sticking with Occidentalis um, for a couple couple more questions here. Um, I've only ever seen one about twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and this is Lawrence Kinsley asking if it's a series of distinct populations. I think it was. Again, I, it's, um, I've got to try and remember what Steve says in the book. I think originally um, it was found to be reasonably distinct. But because of this um, ability of, for them to, because they thought they were separate species, but once they became, once they can reproduce and produce this intermediate form, it, it means that it's actually not separate species. And the, the, I think it says in, in, in the book that because of that, it start, they've, they've started, the, the intermediate form will, will, will take over. Um, so where, so there may well still be distinct um, populations, um, but where where they can where they meet, 
they will um, form the intermediate. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the details of that. As I say, it's, I don't live in the Southwest and it's in the, I've rarely encountered the species. Um, but from what I can recall, that's the kind of thing that's at play here. You've got a, a, a distinct Aniscus ocellus and, a dis, and, and areas of distinct Occidentalis, but that's, that's merging and that's that's being lost and it's it's the occidentalis which is being lost so before long you may find there's a cellus and intermedia and how long has this been known to be at play then as as, as has the <laughs> subspecies been known for a not long, long time no um it's a classic tale actually um without going into too much detail i can't tell you how long ago it's perhaps 20 years um, if I kept my finger on the page, I could tell you Dave Bilton, who um, now lives in that neck of the woods, did all the work. And so if you, if you want to find the information, um, David Bilton um, is, the, is the name of the author, um, lead author, at least on, on several of those papers. Um, the classic story, which I didn't waste people's time with last week, but it is just classic when it comes to why on earth collect specimens and and, and misnaming and things. But the long and short was he realized that he'd found this new species, Occidentalis, um, and had to describe it. And in order to describe it, he went to the description for Aniscus ocellus. And um, again, I, apologies to Dave and other people who know better, but uh, roughly the story is that the description um, needed to be rewritten. So Dave went to find the type specimen of Aniscus acella so that he could write that in detail to the same detail that he was writing Occidentalis's description. Um, he went to the specimen, the type specimen of Aniscus acellus, the probably the most common woodlouse and most well-known woodlouse to everyone. And he got the tube from the Linnaean Society and found that it was Porcellio Scaba. So, <laughs> since give or take, you know, a rough sort of generalization, woodlice are either in the Porcellio side of things or they're in the Aniscus side of things, it would have meant net changing the names of just about all woodlice when they realized that the description of Aniscus ocellus was based on Porcellio scaba. That was chaos. So I believe the story goes that um, with the possibility of all woodlouse names changing effectively, or at least many of them, um, permission was granted to go to Linnaeus's back garden, find a proper Aniscus ocellus and deem that as the new type or at least a paratype specimen so that was then described so the description is based on an actual aniscus ocellus not on a porcellio scaba so it's a complicated tale and i say apologies if there are some inaccuracies in there but the gist is that um yeah it wasn't what it was supposed to be so when he, he, re, he wrote, he, all he wanted was to write a new species description for Occidentalis and ended up with all this major taxonomic rearrangement to, to be done unless he just had a new type specimen uh, which solved everything and kept it as it was. Um, but then ironically, it turned out it wasn't a species, it's a subspecies. So. There you go. That's the story I decided to omit, but now it's in. Good. So, yeah, so, well, <laughs> I didn't realise that sort of thing happened, really. Mm. Um, Linnaeus. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, so, so I, I, maybe perhaps a final question on this subspecies then. This is from... Uh, <laughs> no! <laughs> um, Sabira... Uh, shake I, I hope I'm saying that right um, do they have pleopodal lungs um no it's an aniscus it's an aniscus ocellus aniscus ocellus doesn't have pleopodal lungs it's porcellio 
um, unless you're Linnaeus, <laughs> and, and, then, and then it does. Um, so no, they don't. Okay. Um, oh. That's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. On to a question from Janet Harrison. Um, do Porcelinoides prurinosus, prurinosus yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have a softer exoskeleton as if they are newly shed? Um, no, it's not softer. I mean, it looks like it is. It just it looks like it's soft. It's it's newly shed, um, but it's a perfectly good. Um, cuticle uh, as has all the wood lice it's just that 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 dusting on the um, surface that just rubs off they're, they're, you know they're a, they're reasonably robust you can pick them up um, I mean I, normally if I was doing a, a live uh, event I'd always go and get I'd always bring in a bit of poo um, with some with some wood lice on because they are just they are fantastic and they're lovely but by the time they've been in captivity for a little while and got knocked about a bit uh, in travel and transport. Um, they're sort of shiny and and look like largely any other woodlouse. So they, they they look like they're soft, but they're not. They actually um, the orange appearance is like when they're a bit younger. I'd like to see one where it just shed its skin. Actually, I just wonder what and a nicely pruinose one which has just shed its skin. I'm not quite sure. So an an interesting thing for me to try and find out that it would be it would be interesting um but you know go find your local your local dung heap i i i, I did a project called um some years ago where i went and searched the dung heaps of sheffield and north derbyshire and um and it's just really interesting to see where they are and where they're not because they're quite under recorded now and the distribution has definitely receded over the years with horse drawn uh, transport declined. But that's, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure now because there's such a huge um, increase in stabling and, and horses, certainly is around here. Um, I think they're probably doing much better because I think they used to be transported around a lot, um, but, but not so much now. Um, but I, I, there are a lot more habitat for them now. I say there's a lot more dung out there, folks get in it. Um, they're very easy things to record. So are we, are we talking about any sort of large herbivore dung? Um, I find, uh, yeah, yeah, really. Um, I, think, I think people have declared preferences. Um, I, I've certainly searched in cattle, dung, heaps, and, and stables, you know, horse stables. I, I think horses, good um, but also um, cattle farmyards not sheep you don't see piles of sheep dung particularly um, and I don't know what else I don't know I have I've looked a couple of times in alpaca and not found it but I wasn't in a place where I've recorded it out in other dung either so I don't know so you know go and have a look in some alpaca um, but again, alpaca. I think it's I think it's the temperature that the compost generates. I think is what they like. I think it's just sees them through the winter and enables you know year round reproduction. I suspect, but I don't, but but it can be really hot. Uh, a good compost heap or a good um, dung heap. It, it, you know, I've almost burnt my hands in them. So um, beware. <laughs> um, so, so you're talking about pretty mature dung then that's, that's, yeah. that's been on the ground for quite a while. I can't describe it well, but I know what I know a good one when I see one. <laughs> <laughs> I know a good dung when I see it. Yeah, not absolutely fresh, but not ancient. But equally, you will get ancient dung heaps with, with plenty in as well. And around the edges of... Um, cattle stalls um, and, and I mean, if people are very fastidious cleaning out their horse stables, they're not so much, but often it's quite caked on and almost laminated in, in a farmyard. And you can always peel laminations of, of, of cow pat 
Um, this is a great conversation, is it? Have, have you all finished eating by now? <laughs> it's um, starting to sound like Darren Mann, who's, who really <laughs> knows the exact sort of type of dung for each dung yeah. beetle. Yeah. yeah, but it's true. You, yeah, it's just it's just the right amount of moisture, and I, it's that lamination thing. Um, in Sheffield, there are there are a couple of urban um, farms, so like educational urban farms, and their compost heaps and dung heaps are just fabulous and for pseudoscorpions as well and you've got you know just ask permission to to rummage uh, in their their dung heaps and their compost and you know they've there are a whole range of different they're, they're, they're probably goat and 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 cattle and horse and all sorts in an urban uh, city farm um but but really good for you know, nowhere else, nowhere for miles around have these species, but in the centre of Sheffield, effectively, they're there because of, there's a city farm. So go and go and have a, I mean, seriously, folks, I really would <laughs> go and have a look in Don. It's, um, it's a really, because they're really nice species to find Porcellia dilatatus and Porcellia nides pronosus, which you may not find anywhere else, you know, go and tick them off and, and have a look for them. Um, they're sort of captive audience. They're just waiting for you to find them. Okay, great stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm just well, reading about the Indonesian mantises that are frightened of Philoskia muscorum. That's fascinating. <laughs> okay, mm. doesn't 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 like them. Fair enough. Interesting. Thank you very much, Caitlin. That's that's novel. Didn't know that. But then again, I don't know much about Indonesian double shield mantises, let's be honest. OK, well, uh, we'll go to another question from the chat and um, this one from Anne G. Why curl up in a ball? Surely you are easier to swallow. <laughs> no, apparently not. And uh, certainly um, the, the prey, I, I would say that I think I've read this quite specifically somewhere that um, we're not talking about, it's not really necessarily mammals that are their major prey, uh, major predator. I mean, you know, you will get I know, shrews and whatever else are, are going to feed on them, in which case, you know, they pop popping a few pills. It's, it's fairly straightforward for, for a little mammal. But if you're being preyed on by a Dystera crocata spider, um, they, then They've got to be very specialised to get into a armadillidium, um, and and there are quite a lot of things that maybe don't recognise. I mean, I don't. Sometimes it's, it's quite hard as a human to recognise that a pill millipede or a pill woodlouse is actually an invertebrate, and um, I think I think it's a, it's a pretty good it's a pretty good um, defence to just be armour plated all the way round. Um, and they are really quite impenetrable unless you're a parasitic fly or a specialised spider. Um, but yeah, if you're the sort of thing that's big enough to just crunch into them, then there's not much you can do anyway, whether you curl up into a ball or not. Um, but I guess they, it's also a very good way to retain moisture. And the armadillidium species are generally more surface active. They tend to be things like, you know, these things that have been found in sand dunes. You know, it's a very drying environment. Um, so it's, it's a very good anti-desiccation defense as well. Um, so they do this even when they're not sort of um, trying to avoid predation? It's hard to know, really. I, mean, I, don't, um, I think it's primarily a response to being exposed to light when somebody uh, moves a log or a stone or being disturbed, which it's so therefore is it is it because the light is shining? Is it because it's suddenly it's protection from, um, you know, within the humidity has been removed? Is it responding to the, uh, the being touched? Um, so I, I'm not sure. It's interesting, even as I say that, Woodlife said last week, like to touch one another and like to be gathered together for protection and anti-desiccation purposes. I don't know how true that is of the armadillidiums, whether they like to be 
side by side because they don't necessarily they're so enclosed within their armor i don't know whether that's necessary for them to um group together in the same way but you do you, you see them certainly curled up but then that's i've just disturbed them in finding them you're not just seeing them lying at the side of the path curled up in a bunch they will always be under something or hidden so i don't know if it's a response to me the light or, or temperature or what so hmm, intriguing and yeah. while we're on the subject i, I mean just not that I'm preempting the questions you're picking off, but I noticed that someone was asking how to find Armadillidium porcellum, which is the beautiful multicolored um, little Armadillidium. And, and they are very small when, when, when you find them. Um, I mean, it, when they're curled up, they're perhaps two millimeters in diameter, a bit, perhaps up to four when they're walking. And I would, I tend to find those in scree. Uh, in limestone scree or in, in grassland but even when it's in grassland it's usually in sort of friable small particles of, of, of limestone even then so whether it's it's small scale limestone bits or large scale limestone bits um, they curl up into a ball and appear to be a piece of limestone um, so that the slightest disturbance and they curl up into a ball and they're a good thing to sieve. You know, a fine sieve is a very good way to find things in scree and friable limestone. Um, um, but but you can you can be fortunate. And if if they're in a biggish rock embedded in grassland, then turning that over um, more often than not, they'll roll off and be on the surface of the soil. But they might still be trotting about if there were. Um, spaces underneath the rock you might find them actually just still moving um, but more often than not they roll off and um, fall down into the soil so but they're they're not that difficult to find pictum is a swine to find um, but i found that up trees i found armadillidium pictum you want to look up trees um, not exclusively but don't be surprised to find um, this really rare um, beautiful woodlouse um, in a sort of rot hole um, in, in, in where, where some branches meet, um, which I find ridiculous because basically when I disturb them, they roll into a ball and they're up a tree. So the last thing you want to be if you're a species that lives in a tree is a thing that will turn into a ball and roll down again because you have to climb back up again, aren't you? Um, so I find it quite strange to find something that turns into a very good ball um you know at head height and a tree mm. and, and beyond i have to climb trees sometimes so that's actually top tip for finding armadillidium pictum um always worth recording i mean it's a really scarce beast but fabulous creature really pretty and they can be all sorts they're really quite green quite nice that on, on the trunks um, they're sort of underneath moss or underneath loose bark um, or kind of in the friable material that you get where there's a rot hole, something like that. I mean, the other great thing, I mean, if you, they will be also in scree and they'll also be in the grass and the leaf litter at the base of the tree. They, they're often on very steep hillsides. And my, you know, a number of times I found them on, on really quite steep um, hillsides. Um, which are sort of not, neither acid nor alkaline or there's, there's, yeah, I think Steve's book has tried to summarise these various factors, but yeah, but for me, uh, but then we found them in limestone dales and, and grassland as well. So it's not, they're funny old things. The nice thing is if you're in limestone like that and you're sieving for the little ones, you might also find some really interesting um, centipedes and millipedes and pseudoscorpions and harvestmen as well. I mean, it's just, it's just great stuff to sieve. Thank you, uh, and thanks for that question, Coughnod Richard. I, and I and I know oh, you're Richard. no stranger to turning over scree <laughs> all <No>. day long. <laughs> so. I'm sure you're well used to it, but yeah, big sieves. Um, 
Okay, uh, a question from Lawrence Kinnersley. Um, are any wood lice capable of parthenogenesis? Parthenogenesis. <laughs> I always say that wrong. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm thinking about the low frequency of males in yeah. T. Uh, Pusillus. That would, that was, that would be my answer. I, I don't actually know, to be quite honest, if there are specifically partner genetic ones, but they must be some, uh, they, I, I assuming that for, it's not, I, I, I think I used to know, but um, I, I say it's a while since I read those papers since they, um, they were sort of recognised as two distinct species. Um, there are, yeah, when there's a 50-50 male-female balance in um, uh, provisorius, obviously that's a sexual reproduction thing going on there. Um, they are so scarce in um, Pusillus that there has to be, there has to be parthenogenesis going on. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being confident about it because I can't, and honestly, say I've read it recently, but yes, it must be. They must be parthenogenetic. There you go. <laughs> Got to be, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I, that was some very busy male um, pusillus doing the rounds, which is ridiculous. It's not going to be like male pusillus trotting around trying to, and finding all the females. So they must be. They must be parthenogenetic. So I mean, could, could, would it be? I mean, I, I, presumably this will be this will be in a in a publication somewhere. But c couldn't you just collect a, a number of females and and sort of mark them or something? And it has been suggested, yeah, that um, you can you can make the assumption to an extent with the population. Um, but if you're going to collect that many, you're going to soon find a male. Um, I think, I can't remember what the proportion is, but it might be like one in a hundred pusillus are males or something like that. So it's not, they're not, they're not really scarce. It's not like one every four miles, you know. Um, but I think, um, I, I just don't, I think they're scarce enough. For, I can't imagine there are just a few males out there that are fertilizing all of the females. Um, and there are, there are, there are harvestmen which, are both, and depending on where they find themselves, they're parthenogenetic, but in other areas, they produce males. Um, so that, that partial sexual and parthenogenetic reproduction is, is a thing. So um, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise, but um, it's in the book. I'm not gonna sit and read it to you, but you know, you can all go and have a look at it. Um, it's on there somewhere. It, it may even be on the BMIG website under the species description at Pinch, it's possible. Um, but I'm pretty sure Steve says something about it in there. I, I think he's got three pages on the subject in there and all the references. So um, have a look at that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, okay, a question from Kyra Wallace. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong again that name um what is the body length of um t pygmaeus and t provisorius provisorius um <laughs> off the top basically pygmaeus is three millimeters long provisorius is more like five, um up to about five I could probably give you an answer if I open this book, couldn't I? Um, it, it's, a, it's of that order. They're about four times longer than um, Provisorius pusillus, um, whereas Pygmaeus is, is just very small. Right, Pygmaeus, minute to four millimetres, and Pusillus, and uh, therefore Provisorius, small to five millimeters well okay that's not much difference but actually in um pusillus is that little bit bigger uh, that's yeah this is saying up to five millimeters this is saying up to four millimeters but pygmaeus isn't really up to four millimeters it's usually smaller than that 
so okay that half the size let's say two millimeters and four millimeters or two and a half and five something like that okay so a big difference um, yeah pucillus is uh, pygmaeus is easy to find um but you, you always question whether it's juvenile or the others it is easy to find it's quite common um, but people don't recognize it for what it is um and and yeah you'll just Pucillus is dead obvious. It's this little chocolate brown thing running around everywhere and you lift leaf litter up and wood. Um, Pygmaeus will be under under some stones and under, under a log or something and, and you'll just see it there. Um, not rushing about quite so much. Okay, uh, a question from Lawrence Kinnersley. Um, going back to dung, uh, are there any wood lice that prefer carnivore dung. I don't suppose that this would be particularly enticing to investigate though. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be a very enticing thing. I don't know. Um, certainly in like, if you've got a dog or a fox or whatever, and you've got, um, or cat, um, dung in the back garden, it's just your sort of Porcellio scabers um, that we're feeding on it. I, I've not got a lot of dung like that in my garden thankfully. Um, so I don't know, I've not observed any specific, but I think I think the ones that are, the logic of it would be Porcellia scaber and the armadillidiums tend to be that little bit more surface active, tend to wander about more and are, are more likely the sort of things that are wandering across a lawn rather than uh, in through leaf litter and things. Um, so I think the ones that you're likely to observe are likely to be those bigger, chunkier species. But I don't know if, you know, again, at a micro level, there will be dung all over the place. Um, but it is hard to know because as recorders, we recoil from the um, carnivore dung generally, unless I'm sniffing a badger latrine. But, um, or enjoying the smell, the heady smell of an otter sprained, you know. Um, but generally speaking, I'm not, I'm not looking for the details of wood lice in relation to my carnivore poo. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, and then Anne G was just um, commenting, um, maybe rolling into a bull and falling off a tree is a good avoidance and defense against avian predators like tree creepers possibly i mean maybe but it could easily be something like that i mean where i find them there are tree creepers there are nut hatches there are red starts and I'm not suggesting red starts picking wood lice off trees but um yeah it might, maybe um there's a possibility but uh, yeah i don't know but it's not, it's not like lots of wood lice are climbing trees, and it's not like all the Armadillidium pictums are up in trees, it's just that locally it happens that that's where they are. And, uh, and that's where I, if you ask me to go find you on tomorrow, that I go to those trees. But I'm not okay. going to tell you where they are. <laughs> the red data book species, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Yeah, not not a uh, not a theory that would be easy to uh, observe either. No, 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 they're too rare and too infrequent to do much work in that respect. No. Um, Kovnod Richard is just commenting that uh, a depressus yeah. likes dog poo in yeah. um, a place in Wales that I can't pronounce. Carnarvon. Carnarvon, of course. Yeah. Carnarvon. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> At night. Yes. Okay. So depression is yeah. Depression is quite a quite an urban. I mean, that's another one of these really. You know, it's a very chunky things from the armadillidiums, and um, I've seen them on sort of urban streets. Um, and clearly, there's dog poo in urban streets. Um, so I guess in an area where you know there's perhaps a lot of concrete. Um, you know, it's a bit of decayed matter that a, a woodlouse can devour, I guess. So why not? But I, I think you've got to be something capable of walking around 
those kind of dry urban areas to find it sometimes. I'm not going to do a dog poos woodlouse survey, sorry. Um, I drew the line at leaping into fields in the, in the Peak District. That, that was much more pleasant, thanks. You get the odd, the odd sulfur beetles in them. But, um... Yes, yeah, it's good for that stuff. Yeah, lots of nice little spiders too. You can't beat a bit of dog it's for a, <laughs> a fun afternoon. All right. Lots of thank yous and, and positive uh, feedback for you there, there, Paul. And well, it's been there. They've been coming in since since the end of your your talk, actually. Um, so it's it's been a really another fascinating evening um, on wood lice. And I was, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm really glad that this has been a, a, a two parter because um, it's you know really nice to get that that um, sort of social history and. And, and stuff in the in the in part one and then this has been really quite different but very much complementary to you know the overall wood lice information for people to to take in